on the Honourable Tony Ryle to make uh, his valedictory statement. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by acknowledging three very special people, my wife, Cara, son, uh, Llewellyn, and daughter, Maisie, who are with us here today. Thank you very much for the fantastic support and contribution that you've made to my career. My wife will tell you that in 1997, when we got married, I told her that I was only going to do another six years in Parliament. <laughs> I think I actually said six terms, but she's running that line. <laughs> I'd also like to acknowledge my parents, Malcolm and Lenore, who have come down from Whakatani today, my mother-in-law, Pam, and the rest of the family who are here too. Can I say it's been an absolute privilege to work with a group of exceptional and highly talented people in the National Party over the last 24 years. Every one of those people has been an outstanding New Zealander, and it's just been the greatest honour to have any association with them over that time. And I have to tell you, I think they're all looking absolutely fantastic uh, this evening. I was first elected in 1990, uh, one of 32 new MPs who came to Parliament in that stage. That's actually bigger than some caucuses uh, in the Parliament. And I must say I'm really surprised in the intervening years just how much I have forgotten. Because actually I knew everything when I first came here uh, in 1990. I'd spent 14 months campaigning. I'd like to acknowledge the support of my parents during all that period of time. Uh, 14 months campaigning and it was a fantastic opportunity to learn so much about the different communities and what was then the East Cape electorate. Uh, and, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time door knocking to get known in those days. And, I, and, you know, you really have to take every opportunity. And I was out door knocking in, I think it was Richard Street in Oporiki, just opposite the high school, I think. And it was not the most salubrious part of my electorate. And I'm out there knocking on this door, and then all of a sudden, along from the side of the house, comes this pit bull. Terrier, and it looked at me, and I looked at it, and it came for me. And you know, I got my clipboard and I tried to protect myself. It bit my leg. It hung on my hand. I had this dog like this, and I was really, and I managed to get rid of it. And I've got to say, it was really quite a worrying experience. So I got back in my car and I drove back home to Fakatani and uh, I rang up Ian McLean, who's with us here today, who was my caretaker MP. And I said, "Oh, Ian, I've had a very bad day." been bitten by a dog. Great! <laughs> no, no, I said, I've been bitten by a dog. He said, fantastic. Did you get a photo? <laughs> so I drove all the way back to the point. <laughs> Had my hand rebandaged. Nice picture in the paper. And in fact, that story got on the front page of the Herald, which was no mean feat when you're a new candidate. I think they were somewhat attracted to my quote that the dog bit me, but if it had been the Labour candidate, it would have eaten her. <laughs> Uh, I've been supported uh, locally in the National Party by a great team of people over the years. Uh, you know who you are and I'm very grateful for all the support that you've given me. Uh, when I came to Parliament back then, um, David Longy and Robert Muldoon were still here. Uh, and I had dinner with Sir Robert one night. I've got to tell you, after I struggled to make any conversation, we sat there and ate our dinner for 15 minutes in silence. <laughs> and then he got up and he went, ah, that was really good, let's do it again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yep, great. Um, but look, uh, it's been fantastic, and it's just I've had tremendous satisfaction from the work that we've done in the electorate. And I just was reflecting on today and some of the amazing things that people ask you to do. I remember just a few days before Christmas, a lady rang me up and said, my husband is stranded on a live sheep shipment in the Middle East and I can't get him home for Christmas. <laughs> so you'd ring your MP. And uh, I rang Don McKinnon, and he got home for Christmas. And that was fantastic. The number of people who you've assisted at their saddest time to get bodies back to New Zealand when their children have died overseas, and the fantastic support that happens there. And I'm reflecting on um, every year our family gets a Christmas card and an email um, from some guy that I helped 22 years ago. And every year he sends a Christmas card. And I've been reflecting for years what I actually did to help him. 
<laughs> but whatever it is, it's just been marvellous. I, I'd like to reflect on my electorate agents. I'd like to acknowledge them, Pam Eglinton. Actually, the best employment decision I ever made, because she's now my mother-in-law. <laughs> Uh, Robin, Pam, Jenny, Trish, Nigel and Jackie have been fantastic in the work that we've done. We've had a lot of challenges in our area, a lot of natural disasters, you know, floods, oil spills, kiwi fruit collapses, Labour governments. Uh, <laughs> we've got through them all. <laughs> the, I want to also acknowledge just the constituents have been fantastic. They've been kind, they've been incredibly generous. Uh, to my family and I over all the years. Often you hear about people you know, getting problems with constituents shouting and screaming at them. I've got to say that people of the Bay of Plenty and the East Cape have just shown the greatest kindness and generosity uh, to me and my family over the time, and I would like to pay great tribute to the people of the Bay of Plenty. It's been a very fast-growing electorate in the Western Bay of Plenty. For example, when I started as the MP for Papamoa, came into my electorate in 1996, there were 6,000 people. Today there's 21,000. So it just goes to show, you know, get a good MP, lots of people shift, <laughs> lots of people shift to the area. Uh, I was, um, I want to acknowledge Dame Jenny Shipley, who was Prime Minister, who promoted me to Cabinet in 1997. It was my great privilege to play a part in delivering New Zealand's first woman Prime Minister. Yes. Uh, and it was a great privilege. We were a group, as we were planning that, uh, called the Tipuki Bypass Committee, as some will remember, and it's a great pleasure to me that we're now spending $400 million on the proper Tipuki Bypass, <laughs> and that will be opening shortly. Uh, Mrs Shipley gave me the fantastic opportunity to be a minister. I've got to tell you that when you had a, um, a young baby at the time, your mind's sort of on everything, and I remember uh, pulling in at the Whakatane Airport one day and uh, taking the baby out of the car and checking the luggage in and getting stopped by a constituent and then we flew off to Auckland and as we were flying there was an announcement. Uh, Mr Ryle, uh, we're just letting you know that your car keys are at Wakatani Airport. Um, you left them in your car running with the driver's <laughs> door open. So always pays to have a sign written car. Opposition was, incre opposition was incredibly frustrating um, and a very frustrating nine years but the one thing I learned there is that it's a great opportunity to listen and learn and travel the country and find out about things that you didn't really know. And so many people um, were very generous in their time in helping me in that role. Uh, in 2005, Dr Brash, who's here today, gave me responsibility as being uh, the health spokesman. I'll touch on that shortly. I've certainly appreciated the responsibility the Prime Minister's given me as SOE Minister, uh, working with Bill in the Mixed Ownership Model Programme. Uh, Bill commented to me the other day that um, I've, uh, in both my roles as SOE Minister under Mrs Shipley in this role, uh, we've privatised or partially privatised $7.7 .7 billion worth of assets. He thought that was more than Richard Preble, but we're not going to tell anybody about that. <laughs> Prime Minister also gave me the job as Minister of Health. I've got to say, this has been the best job in the government. You work with quality people every day who are dedicated to the welfare of New Zealanders. And I wake up most mornings and I turn to my wife and say, oh, imagine being Minister of Education. <laughs> <laughs> now that is a really tough job. Uh, look, I think many people underestimate the size of the health sector in New Zealand. It's 10% of GDP every dollar spent in New Zealand, 10 cents is spent in the health sector, not only in our $15 billion public health service with 75,000 staff, but a very strong and dynamic private sector, billion dollars in natural health products, a billion dollars in health IT and devices, some great New Zealand companies. And I think it's this intersection of health and technology that's going to provide an opportunity to create untold wealth into the future and it's really important that New Zealand's part of that. I'm very proud of our government's health plan that we're rolling out and continue to do. I think the seminal decision was that we would stick with the structures that we would inherit, that we inherited, and really focus on results and improving performance. And I think over the last six years, our doctors and nurses and the team have delivered exceptional results for New Zealanders across quality, productivity, the financial domains within constrained funding. 
are those six national health targets. You know, doctors and nurses are very competitive people and no one likes being at the bottom of those national health targets. And that's really driven much better performance, 40,000 extra elective surgeries, smarter emergency, or quicker emergency departments, much faster cancer treatment, uh, immunisation. I noted Dr Hutchison talked about the fact that in 10 of our 20 district health boards, the two-year-old Maori immunisation rate is now higher than the Pākehā immunisation rate. No one would ever have thought that that was possible in New Zealand. Shorter cardiac weights, tobacco smoking, fantastic work that we've done there. I went to the World Health Assembly in Geneva. I've got to say only two overseas trips I've taken, Prime Minister, as Minister of Health. And uh, I was there talking about this work that we're doing in Smoke Free New Zealand 2025, a program that we've systematised across the whole country called ABC. Ask if you're a smoker. If you are, it's a brief B for a brief conversation, because that's quite effective in getting people to quit, and C, offer you cessation medicine, A, B, C. So I went to the health, World Health Assembly, and I was giving a talk about this, and I don't know how many people in this house have ever given a speech where you lose your audience. Never happened to me before that time. And uh, everyone from sort of Africa started talking amongst themselves. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've caused an international incident. So I completed my contribution and I sat down next to a lady from Jamaica and I said, well, why was everyone from Africa sort of quite, you know, dislocated by my speech? And she said, well, in Africa they have ABC for HIV AIDS. A for abstinence, B for be faithful, and C if you can't use a condom. And they couldn't work out how that stopped smoking. <laughs> so we've got a lot of acronyms in this area. Uh, look, it's been a fantastic portfolio, and with the Prime Minister's support, we've achieved quite a lot. I think this decision that we made to fund 12 months Herceptin for New Zealand women is something that's made a huge difference to the lives of so many people. And I remember an experience I had at a coffee cafe in Tauranga a couple of weeks after the 2005 election. And I'm standing in the line and this chap who I'd never met came up and gave me this big bear hug. Which, oh, this is very dislocating in public. <laughs> and, uh, and it turned out to be a guy who said that a month before the election he'd had to put his house on the market to get the money to buy her septum for his wife. And, he, and the day after the election, he was able to take his house off the market. Which is fantastic, that contribution. So we've done a lot. Um, I must say I've had a fantastic opportunity meeting a lot of people in the health service. Uh, it always pays to be very careful. Joe Goodhue, as the Associate Minister, is doing this hand hygiene thing. So I was visiting an endoscopy suite uh, a couple of years ago. And I thought, well, here's a great photo opportunity with the hand gel, which I did and proceeded to do this, to which every person... Uh, in the endoscopy suite theatre, gasped in horror, and I thought, well, what's all the worry here? Well, of course, it was lubricating gel. Which was... <laughs> so we're going to get that prostate cancer awareness um, program started. And I wanted to spend a little bit talking about, um, you know, what the next 10 years in this health area is going to be because, you know, with chronic disease and ageing, the rate of population growth or ageing of people over age, 20, over age of 80 is going to treble in the next 10 years. So everything's going to stop this, who, who's over 65 is just, you know, not the issue anymore. It's because 65 is the new 45. I'm trying to convince myself as I get there. So I think there are five big megatrends and it's just the interaction between all of them is just going to change healthcare completely. First of, first of the five is um, care closer to home. All this care is coming out of hospitals, into communities, into people's homes. Uh, pharmacists, GPs, home care, uh, rather home care workers, nutrition advisors, all these people are playing a greater role. And there's going to be this much greater uh, responsibility we're all going to have to take for our health care in something that they call self-care. It's a bit like here in New Zealand. They're getting us to do all the work and we like it. Uh, this is where we're going to have to take responsibility. Uh, you know, Sir Ron Avery is developing a piece of technology, the scientists of your wristwatch, with a beam that's 
comes on your wrist and measures your temperature, your blood pressure and your pulse. And that information is then transmitted to a device that can be monitored by your general practice. So you can imagine this, this technology thing is going to change everything. And as it, that's my second point, is this anywhere, anytime use of innovative technology is going to change a healthcare. It's this device is just going to help change everything over the next five to ten years. You're going to be able to plug your own personal ultrasound device into your cell phone. And you can imagine beaming that message to your local GP. These advances are incredible. Thirdly, um, intelligence and insight from big data. This work that we're doing, collecting information across government departments, across patients, across people, with all the privacy protections, is going to allow us to build a picture on how healthcare interventions change people's lives and are the best place to do it. The fourth is personalised medicine. So all this knowledge about your genome and your biomarkers are going to allow clinicians to develop very personalised therapies solely to you. And they're going to be able to provide you with information about your risk factors into the future. This has huge ethical issues about whether we actually want to know these risks. But this um, personalised medicine is going to be amazing. And I think the fifth big trend that's going to affect healthcare is that we're going to have this expanding role of non-physicians and payment that actually rewards the quality of care and the outcome that people provide. I'd like to also just take a moment to thank the fantastic people who've supported me over the years. I'd like to acknowledge my ministerial staff, in particular my head of filing, Peter McArdle. Uh, thank you for the wonderful contribution they've all made. Officials at the Ministry of Health, the State Services Commission, Treasury's um, SOE unit, the Travel Office, um, the security guards, the Bellamy staff, the messages in the gallery offices, the VIP drivers, cleaners, the district health board staffs, and the chairs in particular. But I can't finish off without uh, acknowledging uh, my three comrades, Bill, Nick and Roger. You know, Parliament can be a very lonely place. It can be full of self-doubt and frustrated am ambition. And I think it's pretty unusual for any member of Parliament to have had three very close friends uh, throughout their whole career. Uh, the relationship with those guys has been enduring and sustaining. Uh, they're extremely capable people uh, who've continued to be friends over the last 25 years. Uh, and contrary to public opinion, uh, we, do, we have never worked as a group. Uh, frankly, we can never agree on anything. <laughs> On any issue, it's always 2-2, two, two, and the 2 is always variant. So it's been wonderful to have that association with them. Uh, it's just been the most fantastic association anyone could have in Parliament, and I've just really appreciated the support that those guys have given. Everybody else is going to be going off, and I'm going to be supporting the Prime Minister by campaigning as well, and I wish you all uh, a lot of activity and uh, all the best on our side for the work that you're going to do over the next period of time. Um, and you'll all be going out. Uh, I remember many of you may be doing rest home visits. I stopped those a few years ago. Uh, I went to, I remember going to one and you spent a lot of time you know, giving out your card and, you know, shaking everyone's hand. I had the name tag and I, and I did all that. And as I left the day room, I heard one of the ladies saying, was that the nice new young doctor? <laughs> and then I discovered that all voted two weeks earlier. <laughs> So thank you very much, Mr Speaker, for the opportunity to be here, to thank my fantastic family for the contribution and support that they have made. It's just been marvellous. And thank you for the great privilege it's been to be here to represent the National Party in the Bay of Plenty and work for New Zealand over the last 24 years. As the House is suspended for the dinner break, I will resume the chair at 7.30 p.m.